Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is a uh, my first video blog. Well, my first video blog as part of a regular series. Um, I've been blogging for about maybe over 10 years, 12 years, something like that, in various places. Uh, a lot of my blogging is on my own site. Some of it's been mirrored to LiveJournal. More recently, I've been posting uh, posting to Google+, Plus, which I'm, it's funny how much blogging ends up being a feature of the of the site that uh, the site that you're hosting your blog on. Now, when I was writing my own blog, it was mostly personal with a little bit of technical and uh, projects uh, type focus. On LiveJournal, it was mostly the same, maybe a little bit more personal, although also with a significant political focus. Because at that point in my life, I was starting to think about my political philosophy and philosophy in general, how it fits into that. And on Google+, Plus, it's been more extensive commentary on current events. Um, and part of it is when I was hosting my uh, when I was hosting my blog on my own site, I wrote the software. Uh, I wrote several different versions of the software to to host it, and that made me. I mean, it wasn't a particularly fancy thing. It was just uh, initially it was just wrapping pre tags around big chunks of text, and eventually it became database backed and all of that as I kept on working on the code. But it didn't do anything particularly fancy with links. And with LiveJournal, suddenly uh, everybody that I was friended with, they had accounts. I could lock content off to certain people. And that, that encouraged me to be a little bit more personal at times, while occasionally really extremely personal. Um, talking about dating and depression and uh, all sorts of things that, that go on in, in all of our lives that ordinarily we just chat with friends uh, about. And now that I'm doing a lot of posting on Google+, it happens to be quite good at um, summarizing, providing uh, a little bit of a hook into anything that you post to it. It's, it's not a perfect, um, it's, not, it's not the blogging platform that I would choose, uh, that I would develop myself, but it does have some features that I would have found hard to program myself, like fetching summaries and images and stuff from sites in a reasonable way. Um, one of the things about blogging platforms is that if you really want them to work well, you need to be able to deal with accounts of people who, who read you and decide who gets to see what and maybe decide who gets shown what. And there's a distinction and that you might reasonably decide, I'm going to let people see this, but they'd have to seek it out because I don't think it'd be interesting to them. There's a distinction between that and I only want to let these particular people see this. Anybody else, not allowed. Um, it would be nice to have a site that, uh, that made that distinction or to have software that makes that distinction, but Maybe that's a little bit too complicated for most people to deal with most of the time. So we make do with, with what we have. I mean, Google+, Plus, it also doesn't have threaded discussions, and that's a bit of a bummer. It's basically a flat, um, a, a flat line of comment, comment, comment. And if you want to address multiple people, then you just mention them all, which has certain pluses in that you can address uh, multiple uh, parts of discussion above you without breaking the threadedness of discussion or without po uh, posting multiple times. But in any case, what I'm trying to do with this is to get into the habit of maybe every week doing a video blog, talking about what's going on in my life, things I've been thinking about, events that I've gone to, all sorts of things like that. And if I can get in the habit of doing it weekly, then hopefully I'll be able to keep on doing it. I've started so many projects over my whole life and had them be short-lived. Um, and I found that one way to really keep myself engaged is to have it on a calendar. So what I've done here is I've gone onto a Google Calendar, which I use for my calendaring stuff, and marked every Friday forever uh, video blog. Um, and hopefully I'll stick with it. If I don't, this will 
then you're probably reading this just digging through old archives for some reason, uh, whoever you are, whatever your relation is to me. Um, but I'm hoping that this is something I stick uh, with. One of the other nice things about doing this on a regular basis is that you occasionally see those photographs of people uh, who um, they take a picture of themselves every day, every week, or, or something like that. And you can really see how a person's face changes, how their ideas change, and, and stuff over time. I'm doing that to a certain extent with blogs anyhow, but it's nice to have another medium for that and to have another avenue of comparison. So, what have I been doing recently? Well, this week has been a little bit weird in that I did uh, leave my job uh, this last Monday. Um, it's with, uh, it was with a VPN as a startup, or I mean, a VPN as a service company called Spot Flux. Uh, it was a semi-voluntary leaving, kind of complicated. Uh, I wasn't super happy there. And uh, I was looking elsewhere for quite some time, and now, uh, now I'm uh, I'm out of a job, which I'm okay with, and uh, I'm I do have some opportunities. Uh, I, well, I have one opportunity coming up that I'm really excited about. You never really know when an opportunity if it's going to pan through, uh, but if this works out, it'll be really cool. And so I'm kind of waiting to see if it uh, pans out before I really start seriously looking elsewhere, although I might look for some contract work in the meantime. Uh, in case it's not clear, I'm a programmer, a systems programmer. I've also done research into neuropsychology. Uh, I have a strong interest in philosophy, interest in bioinformatics, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so I'm likely to be looking for a job relating to computers, maybe relating to policy as well. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of neat stuff out there, and I, I don't think I'll be unemployed for too long unless I let myself get too picky. Um, so on Monday, uh, I went to uh, the American Museum of Natural History. You'll be hearing a lot about the American Museum of Natural History if you end up watching a lot more of these uh, for a program called Dreams of Other Worlds, and this. Uh, this was one of the programs that they hold in the, uh, um, in the, oh, what is the word? Uh, astrolabe, that's, that's an, a device, not a place. Uh, in, in the dome, um, in the astronomy dome. And uh, it, covered, uh, it co uh, covered our exploration uh, using telescopes uh, and various other means of other planets looking for uh, planets for, uh, going over other stars or going around other stars, things like that. Great program, a lot of fun. Uh, on Tuesday, I had a migraine, uh, but eventually I got better and I went to a bad movie event in the evening, which was pretty awesome. Also, for much of this early week up until now, I've been playing with a new piece of software. I've occasionally run classes teaching people to program in Python and Perl. And much more seldom I've taught people uh, Unix things, either the basics of how to uh, get around on a Unix system, all the way up to Unix systems internals. And so I rec more recently I've been trying to teach classes on, uh, or put together my, or put together YouTube videos teaching this stuff. Um, but it turned out to be pretty difficult, partly because the way that I was doing it was I was writing my course materials out on this, a whiteboard. And it turns out that that's not a good way to actually teach classes. It's, uh, whiteboards are awkward on, a, on a, a webcam. You have to hold them up. You have to deal with them not being centered right. When you're writing, they're not readable. So. I've been looking to do screencasts instead, and I've been evaluating a lot of different pieces of software, trying to figure out what I can use. And after a lot of poking around, I finally found a piece of software called VocoScreen. Um, I, I'm a Linux guy, uh, mostly, uh, or Unix guy, uh, more, more broadly, but I, I do have some systems running other operating systems. Uh, but VocoScreen, it's uh, available for Linux. Oh, this is one of my cats, by the way, uh, Beefalo. Oh, 
And uh, she's a delightful tricolor cat. And, um, oh, my video went away. Oh, no, maybe it didn't. I just, uh, my, uh, the screen went to sleep. Anyhow, um, Voco screen, the, the problem with a lot of these video capture so uh, softwares is that they're not really, um, they have sucky interfaces and they're often unstable. But Voco screen looks pretty decent. Um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to use it to screencast my lessons and, uh, and have them work out well since Frankly, my face is a lot less useful if you're trying to learn stuff than seeing what I'm typing and doing. And I can uh, put together much better presentations um, with, with screencasting than I can with, uh, with my face. Uh, because even though, I, I mean, in-person teaching, you'll probably want to see my face and I can use a whiteboard, works out great. And we can then huddle around the computer when we actually need to uh, need to code or need to look at code, run demos, stuff like that. That just doesn't work uh, very well for videos. So Vocal Screen looks great. I'm looking forward to using it. I'm starting to experiment with redoing all of my existing videos. Not all of them are, are up on YouTube right now, since I'm still just trying to get the hang of this medium. Um, but I, I have high hopes for Vocal Screen, and that's one of the things that I, I've been looking into this week. Um, so Tuesday evening, I went to see uh, to a bad movie group where we watched old Batman uh, uh, miniseries on TV uh, from the 50s. Terrible, terrible. But somehow, actually, maybe they weren't that bad. Um, they had a certain charm to them. If you're used to, like, if you watched Nick at Night, uh, when you were growing up, as I did, they often played old TV shows from the 50s, 60s, uh, 70s. Um, and you kind of get used to that visual aesthetic, and you got used to the lower uh, quality of uh, broadcast programs back then. And a certain charm. I mean, you weren't really expecting great, uh, great cinema or great, uh, I don't know, artistic merit from the show. But it, it was good enough. It, I actually was almost getting fond of it near the end of the evening, but we were also getting, uh, all of us were getting sleepy. Uh, black and white for some reason. As good as it is as a medium for some kinds of, uh, of film, artistic exploration of, uh, of plot, like the colors don't end up distracting. Um, it's always made me sleepy. Anyhow. So on Wednesday, I went to a discussion group on the high-tech revival of Pittsburgh and the collapse of Detroit, which was pretty neat because I lived for about 10 years in Pittsburgh. I was research staff at Carnegie Mellon University, three separate jobs, all of them really great, fulfilling jobs, working with fantastic people. Um, and uh, and I, I got a pretty good feel of the city. I, I love Pittsburgh. It's, it's a wonderful city. It's not a very big city. It's sleepy at times, but the land is beautiful. There's a, a, enough going on there that you're not likely to get bored. Uh, and it does have a neat uh, tech industry that's starting to grow. So we were talking about the history of Pittsburgh, uh, the history of Detroit, and why Detroit is falling over while Pittsburgh has uh, successfully more or less reinvented itself. And came down to a few things. Uh, uh, or at least the consensus did. It's no guarantee that we're right, but uh, it's, as far as we figured out, has a lot to do with Pittsburgh's um, university system, which is quite strong, whereas Detroit doesn't really have that strong of, an, uh, of a higher educational system. And so while Pittsburgh, its population was thinning out uh, from like maybe the 50s up until 2000s, 2005, um, a lot of its old industry was dying. People were worrying, does the city have a future? All that time, you had students filtering through. And Pittsburgh is very beautiful. I mean, stunningly beautiful. It is a beautiful bit of land, wonderful hills, um, all that. So, so uh, some of the students decided to stick around. And uh, you ended up having this kind of tech revival in Pittsburgh from the slow growth of, uh, of tech industry there. 
and I suspect that the tech industry is going to be huge in Pittsburgh. Now, the interesting thing about it is that it didn't really happen so much in the way of downtown Pittsburgh. It's happened more on the outskirts of the city and in the eastern slice of the city near the universities. But nonetheless, Pittsburgh has benefited from it. I expect it will continue to benefit from it. Both cities are pretty well connected. Pittsburgh is kind of in the middle of nowhere, but it's well connected to the, uh, the highway uh, system in the United States. Um, whereas Detroit is on the Great Lakes and um, it's also well connected by highway, but it's also kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, anyhow, it was a good discussion. Uh, on Thursday, I did laundry, did a lot of cleaning of my apartment, um, kept on working with the, with getting used to the uh, screencast software. And pretty soon I'll be able to upload the first results of my, um, of my retooling of my classes uh, towards, uh, towards screencasting. Um, I will need to re-record them. I'll probably do that uh, tomorrow since I don't think I have anything planned. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much been, uh, I mean, if we're going back into uh, last week, uh, on Sunday, I went to another event at uh, AMNH. On Friday, I went to a Guggenheim After Dark event, which was really neat. It was on Italian futurism. And I didn't really uh, know a lot about futurism as an artistic and cultural movement in Italy. It, it was, I think, from like 1910 until maybe the mid 1940s when, uh, yeah, they were a very interesting and difficult political and artistic movement. They had a questionable choice of allies. Um, they initially were supporting uh, um, Mussolini during uh, World War II, even though the, the fascist movement was a very uh, past looking movement. They captured a little bit of its attention for a while until eventually uh, Mussolini, uh, Mussolini turned on them and purged them. But their art was, was interesting despite their questionable politics and values. Um, fan, uh, fantastic exhibit. I'm, I'm not much of a party person. I've never really been particularly outgoing. So, uh, I mean, the Art After a Dark event, it was kind of a mix of museum goers like me who just hadn't gotten around to seeing the futurism exhibit and people who stayed on the first floor and more or less partied. Um, so once I was done seeing everything, I, I wandered off, but it was, it was a fun time. Maybe at some point I'll get a little bit uh, better at, uh, at these uh, party things. Um, so that's basically what I've been up to. There's, uh, there is an event that, or not an event, a, uh, a recent post by uh, Ashley Paramore, who, who's somebody I kind of sort of knew uh, from the secular movement. Um, a few years back, we met a few times at, uh, at social gatherings, never really became close uh, or anything, but uh, we know each other. Um, she, uh, she's a blogger, uh, among other things, has a very, or has a relatively high profile uh, in social media. Um, her uh, YouTube handle is uh, Healthy Addict. Um, but she posted uh, an interesting post called Pro Life Atheist uh, Republicans about how, in the secular movement, we should uh, deal with um, deal with people who are not liberal. Because, I mean, there have always been uh, atheists of various political persuasions all over the political map. But the secular movement, uh, or at least the, there's a very particular sec, uh, secular movement centered around a, a number of organizations, um, Students for Free Thought, the Secular Student Alliance, uh, Center for Inquiry, and all of that. Uh, and they're more or less vaguely liberal. Some of them are more explicitly liberal than others. Uh, but there's been this question of how how people in other political movements or of other political persuasions, rather, should, uh, whether and how they should be part of the, the secular movement, the, the particular sec, uh, secular movements that we're talking about. I have a bit of a weird perspective on this in that while presently 
uh, or I mean, in, in the past, I was a libertarian, long time ago, from middle school up until maybe the end of college, maybe a little bit after the end of college, although I was changing near the end of college. And I was part of uh, Students for Free Thought. I knew um, August Brunsman, who, who started uh, Students for Free Thought. But I never really felt that I fit in because of the different politics. They were pushing um, vaguely liberal politics, occasionally a little bit more explicitly than I liked. And at the time, I was really into maximizing personal autonomy. And that kind of friction, it, it turned me off a bit. So, and particularly given that uh, some of my history with, uh, in dating people in the group stuff like that. I stopped attending um, uh, meetings for a while, uh, just for a mix of the personal things and the political things. And eventually I, I got back involved uh, more gently, but it became easier as my politics started to shift. Um, but I, I just, I never felt welcome, um, welcome there. Uh, and libertarians, they're not exactly conservative. Uh, they're, they're polit I mean, politics don't so easily, uh, they're not so easily described as just liberal or conservative. You can view these things from all sorts of metrics. But I, yeah, I, I, I never was, was comfortable because of the political difference. The, the, basically, the commitment of SFF to liberalism was a barrier to my involvement with it. Now, nowadays, my politics are liberal, although they're, they are still pretty unorthodox, not really in a libertarian way. Uh, I am an independent socialist at this point. Um, I, my politics have shifted away from what I would say is uh, a fundamentalism, not meaning it necessarily in a bad way, but about personal autonomy. And that I, I still see personal autonomy as important in some domains of life but I don't consider it to be the driving principle in how we organize our politics or what we want. But I never bought into so, so many of the social justice things that have come to define at least some parts of modern liberal, liberal, uh, liberal activism. And even to the extent that I do, the versions of the movements uh, that, uh, or the versions of the principles that I signed on to are not necessarily the dominant ones. For example, with, with feminism, I would say that I'm a gender role abolitionist uh, and that I see the different roles uh, and expectations we have of both genders to be uh, problematic and that in order to, uh, to really fix these issues for men and for women, we need to get rid of those roles, get rid of masculinity and femininity, or at least get rid of them as norms, um, have people, give, give people the solid expectation that they can safely and without uh, much in the way of concrete consequences, like job stuff, um, uh, access to government services, loans, yada, yada. They should be able to, without those kinds of consequences, um, they should be able to date who they like of, of either gender. Uh, they should be able to dress as they like, uh, generally present themselves as they like, um, uh, yada, yada. I mean, there are occasionally reasonable constraints that, that we put on uh, workplace behavior. Like uh, if you expect to uh, wear a dress or a kilt in a job where you're dealing with things where they might get caught on stuff, or if you're going to look like a total freak in in your uh, in your workplace uh, and like smear lipstick up and down both sides of your face and be a, a waiter, that's, that's probably not going to work. And it's not something which I, I stand for, uh, like trying to prevent any consequences whatsoever. But so long as you behave reasonably and normally at work with a reasonable amount of room for self-expression, particularly if you're not working in a public-facing job, there shouldn't be consequences, and you definitely shouldn't be bullied, anything like that. Um, and there shouldn't be consequences for your being of a particular race or, or thing, uh, 
just in general, that's the tolerant tolerance is what I, I stand for. That basically you close your eyes to the difference uh, and provide that nobody's uh, making a, a huge deal out of things in a way that have functional effects. You have a big, reasonably diverse uh, workplace that accepts people of various backgrounds, uh, various beliefs, yada yada. I mean, occasionally you make exceptions if they're well justified, but generally, um, generally you, you leave people a lot of uh, autonomy. You don't make demands on them, uh, and so on. So that's basically my my most basic idea of social justice, and it's my most important notion of social justice. It doesn't mean, though, that I think that everybody's identities have to be recognized or cherished or anything like that. I think that's bullshit if people are claiming that you, you have to cherish all the diversity. But no, I say you tolerate the diversity. But that's the difference I have with some flavors of liberalism. Um, I am a liberal. Uh, I'm not that flavor of, lib uh, of liberal. There are many different flavors. There are many different flavors of conservative. Um, but I think tolerance is the baseline standard. And tolerance also includes being tolerant of people whose, uh, whose political, philosophical, definitional, and other views are, uh, are different. Not everybody has, uh, has the responsibility to speak in a way that makes everybody else feel validated or loved or whatever, just tolerate it. And with that type of tolerance, I think, a society can deal with religious diversity that if somebody thinks you're going to hell, they can think that, so long as they treat you decently uh, in your uh, in your in your day to day life. It doesn't mean to, uh, that they have to shut up, uh, but it does mean that they probably shouldn't be talking your ear off all the time if you're not interested in their belief system about places that don't really exist, like heaven or hell or whatever. Just ignore it, ignore the difference, and it works out. Um, so I, I think, though, that, that when we have these movements, we ideally want to have them be diverse. And, and in order to really do that, I think the movements shouldn't be particularly political. Uh, and they shouldn't take particularly strong stances on social justice issues. People can, believe, uh, or can belong to multiple groups. Uh, again, it, it would be very tempting for me to say, my type of feminism is is the type of feminism for the movement or my type of anti-racism or, or yada yada but no I, I think we all have to back off from these topics in the secular movement leave room for uh, for diverse opinions leave room for conservative opinions leave room for people who are directly affected uh but also leave room for people who whose views cause them to be directly affected because somebody's identity might be just as precious to them as somebody's way of looking at the world. And you can either try and stomp those out to make some groups uh, feel more comfortable than others, or you can leave room for diversity. I prefer to, to be tolerant in big umbrella groups and, um, and uh, leave other groups towards those particular bounds. Um, if, I mean, if, if, some, if, if, if somebody were to decide uh, not to recognize bisexuality, as, as somebody who considers themselves bisexual, I'm fine with that, so long as they treat me okay. If somebody thinks I'm going to hell, uh, but they treat me okay, I'm fine with it. Not with that, somebody thinks I'm damned, whatever. I just don't have to care. Um, I'm going to judge my interactions with people based on, uh, on how they treat me, not what they believe or not uh, what perspective that they use to understand the world. And I offer that to others as well. Provided that there are no functional effects, provided that all there is is the potential of somebody's feelings hurt because somebody disagrees with them, we can cope with difference. And I think our movement needs to cope with difference. I, now, I, I suspect broadly speaking, we can be vaguely liberal, but that should be as vaguely as possible and we can have breakout, uh, breakout groups for, uh, for people who have stronger beliefs uh, that want to explore them. But I believe that generally secular movements are better as broad uh, umbrellas. So I just want to drop a little bit of commentary on that. I know I've probably talked about that endlessly on, on Google+. 
might have done a video on, on this with one of my previous philosophical uh, videos. Um, I might get back in the habit of doing this. Um, I've also been doing some cooking experiments. I've been trying to uh, do things with, uh, with chocolate and uh, savory dishes rather than uh, desserts. I've been trying to make uh, experiment with pancakes as savory dishes rather than desserts. Um, but also I've been eating a lot of, uh, a lot of avocado rolls because they're cheap and delicious and easy to make. All you do is you take nori, you toast it, you stick rice in it, you drop uh, some uh, sliced or mashed avocados in there and put in some soy sauce, yum, you're done. And fortunately, I live in a neighborhood of Brooklyn, which is particularly good for um, chopping uh, for ingredients, uh, uh, food ingredients, in that there are some areas that are higher income where people tend to buy more finished products. Uh, in my neighborhood, it happens to be a little bit lower income, and so people do a lot of cooking, and you, you smell the most wonderful smells walking through my neighborhood. It's, it's fantastic, although I'm not the most amazing cook. I'm trying to get better. Um, but it means that uh, there are tons of raw ingredients. Um, and given that I'm presently jobless, that's, that works out pretty well. Uh, since the more cooking I do, the more money I can save for other things. I, I found that making pasta and dropping uh, avocado into it, that works really well. Pasta and avocado and lots of pepper. And it helps when you're making the pasta if you actually stick the, um, the little uh, pepper uh, bowls or seeds. Are they seeds? I'm not sure. Um, into the pasta while it's being cooked because the texture is kind of fun when you're uh, when you're eating the pasta and, and you like bite down on one of the uh, one of the bowls of, uh, of uh, fresh pepper. But um, yeah, I've been doing some cooking experiments. I've been trying to learn to knit because um, I, I have a phone sock. Um, somebody I was dating for a while uh, knitted a phone sock for me. And, uh, and the phone uh, that I put it in, I think it was a Nexus One at the time, um, it, it's great to protect the screen, but it's kind of worn down. And now one corner of the bottom of it has come open and it's probably going to fall apart soon. So I'm hoping to get, get good enough at knitting that I can uh, knit a replacement before it falls apart completely. Not sure I will, but uh, I'm trying to do that. Um, otherwise, I've been working on some coding projects uh, now that I have a lot of time on my hands and I'm kind of waiting uh, to see if that particular job opportunity pans out, I'm going to be uh, going to be coding on those projects and doing the teaching thing and all the other stuff. Um, uh, you can see my stuff on GitHub and on Google Code and a few other places, uh, SourceForge. Um, uh, so, so yeah, that's pretty much what I've been up to. I'm hoping to do this this kind of thing weekly. Uh, maybe in the, uh, my future things won't be quite so long since I'll be summarizing more what I did over the span of a week rather than what's going on in general in my life. But you never really know because uh, I'm occasionally long-winded and there are a lot of interesting things going on in the world. In particular with, uh, with Russia, I've been fascinated to see exactly how bad Russian uh, governance has, has gotten. They're cracking down on their press. Uh, they're trying to annex a bit of the Ukraine. Um, they, for a long time, they haven't really had a, a functional democracy. They, after the fall of the, of the Soviet Union, people had kind of high hopes that a lot of the corruption would clear out and, um, and that they would have regular transitions of power that weren't predictable and healthy uh, state media that would disagree on things and all that. But they've been really backsliding. And it's interesting to see it happen in the time of their own economic decline and the rise of China and see them still try and test the waters uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. But I'm, I'm keeping an eye on that. There's the continu continuing mess in Syria 
which I find very disappointing that Western powers aren't getting involved in, um, or, or local powers. It just would be nice to remove Assad. Um, it would have been nice to have removed him before all of the moderate rebels were, were wiped out, but what can you do? And that our, our politics are kind of anemic at this point in the United States. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll be doing another one of these next week. And, uh, or at least hopefully I will, if I remember to do so. And we'll, uh, we'll keep in touch, uh, Internet. Anyhow, I'm Pat Dunn. This has been a weekly video blog, or what I hope will be a weekly video blog. And I'll see you again.